this move. I think it's a typical cult move. I mean, here's a team that needed a franchise quarterback. Give me a break. Now, who in the hell is Mel Kuyper? I know, number one, I don't know who is going to work with him down there. Uh, who is, where is the great quarterback coaching genius of the offense? I know Orange Park is a great defensive coach. I don't see where he's going to get this great coach in this guy. He's a bad pick. You can get this guy in the middle of the round if you want to, if you're going to pick him. He won't ever be a stud pass rusher. <laughs> He needs to gain some more weight to fill out and to continue to learn how to use his hands effectively. Can you imagine what I could do if I learned how to use my hands effectively? Wow. There is a huge difference between NCAA and NFL football. Thus, predicting that an outstanding college player will somehow become a great NFL player is a difficult task. There are the underdogs that come out of the blue, like Tom Brady, overlooked players who somehow seem to grow into their bodies, put in the extra effort, and just might end up as the GOAT on a pro football field. Then there is the first rounder who was called a pizza boy and would never be a star, but ended up becoming a three-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year. On the other hand, there are the quarterbacks who were unstoppable in college but quickly become irrelevant in the NFL, even if they were far from that Mr. Irrelevant draft pick. Speaking of Mr. Irrelevant, even those very last picks may have a really productive and lengthy NFL career, like Ryan Suckup for instance. He didn't suck at all. Ladies and gentlemen, in anticipation of us leading up to the most exciting football event of the spring, the NFL Draft, these are some of the worst NFL draft predictions of all time. Break. Aaron Rodgers already had a gold jacket worthy career that somehow is still going. He is now compared to Hall of Famers because as soon as he retires and is eligible, he'll immediately be on the yellow brick road to Canton for his own induction ceremony. Yet when the Cal quarterback was in New York City and followed around with five other top prospects for the 2005 NFL draft, including fellow quarterback Alex Smith, the prediction was that he would be drafted very high, maybe even with the number one overall pick by his hometown team, the San Francisco 49ers. His plan and the predictions quickly went the other direction. As that 2005 NFL draft night kicked off, Alex Smith went number one to the San Francisco 49ers. Then famously, name after name was called, and Aaron Rodgers sat there in his bad suit and even worse facial hair. Look close, it's that patch right on the center of the chin, waiting until the Green Bay Packers selected him with the 24th overall pick. In Green Bay, he would wait, standing in a hoodie with a clipboard, playing behind Brett Favre, but observing would serve him well as soon as he would then break records with all signs to him being a Packer forever, or at least a few more years. The 49ers then had coach Mike Nolan, who has been described as having a strong personality, but also as an unsuccessful reign as a leader in San Francisco, after looking at the Cal quarterback said he did not believe that Rodgers' attitude could coexist with his. His opinion ended up being a very bad take on a very good gunslinger. Years later, Nolan said this regarding his 2005 opinion on Rodgers via a 2016 segment on NFL HQ. The other thing was Alex at the time was a, you know, he's a good kid. Uh, he's a very good person, a uh, very safe choice, you know, always trying to please. Whereas on the other hand, Aaron was, was very cocky, very confident, uh, arrogant. Um, so you kind of say, well, why did you take him to begin with? Because that's really what your best quarterbacks look like. They aren't very pleasing. They aren't very safe. Aaron Rodgers may not get along with everyone, and whether you want to call him cocky, weird, or whatever, that was awkward. Uh... he has had proven that he had no problem winning with this coach or that. Also leading up to the 2005 draft, there were also some really bad predictions surrounding him, even from scouts. These experts had a far different idea of what kind of quarterback Aaron Rodgers would be. I don't like him. He's a clone of Joey Harrington and Kyle Bowler. They all throw the same way. What have those guys done? Nothing. 
If you take him in the second round, fine. Heady guy. They do a marvelous job coaching quarterbacks there. I don't think he's as good as the top quarterbacks coming out last year, said an anonymous AFC scout via USA Today. Joey Harrington had six more interceptions than touchdowns in his career, and Kyle Bowler posted an under 70% completion percentage in his career. Aaron Rodgers has been way more efficient with a shiny 104.5 quarterback rating and a much longer career. As for the San Francisco 49ers, they have struggled to find consistency in quarterbacks since well before 2005, but Aaron Rodgers is still in Green Bay thriving in a different shade of gold. Yet, many admit their mistakes on their opinion of Rodgers and Nolan did just that in 2016. Well, it Basically, we thought in the long term that Alex Smith would be the better choice than, than Aaron in the long term. Uh, I think we became too much involved. It was one of those maybe uh, paralysis to analysis, yeah. really, you know, because we had so much time to think about it. But uh, we put a lot of stock in, in uh, Aaron's, uh, changing Aaron's throwing style, sure. you know. Uh, we also got caught up a little bit in that Alex was so mobile. That was a good thing. But in the end, like I said, we, we felt that Alex would be the better long term guy. Obviously, we were wrong in that, in that thought process. But, uh, During the 2000s, 2011 NFL Draft, when the Houston Texans were on the board with the 11th overall pick, Roger Goodell announced the name of J.J. Watt. However, as the cameras panned to the Texans fan party, booze poured from the crowd that was filled with many upset and rather inebriated Houston fans, the same fans who would be soon purchasing their own 99 Watt jerseys, but on draft day told reporters that they had never heard of him. Those quote-unquote fan experts who had more experience eating pizza than playing football then complained that Watt was the type of player that their team could get in the middle rounds. One pro Texans writer for Culture Map Houston had a really bad take writing that the team missed out on a star by not drafting Auburn player Nick Fairley, who he said would quote unquote collect Pro Bowl berths for years to come. Nick who? Exactly. Then that same writer, when talking about how the Texans took a former Pizza Hut delivery man instead of a future pro bowler, stuck his foot directly into his mouth by saying, Watt is a great story, but it's hard to imagine him ever being a star. It's hard to see him changing games for Houston on defense. That once Wisconsin-born pizza delivery man, though, had been a Ronnie Lott Trophy winner in 2010, voted AP and Sports Illustrated second team All-American, all Big Ten first team, academic all Big Ten and was voted the team's MVP while harassing Big Ten quarterbacks at the University of Wisconsin. Saying it would be hard to imagine J.J. Watt as a star was one of the worst predictions of any draft, because Watt, so far, is a three-time Defensive Player of the Year, 2012, 2014, and 2015, a five-time First Team All-Pro, a five-time Pro Bowler, and was the NFL sack leader two times. The all-around good guy, which no one argued with, at least they were right in that, is also a NFL Walter Payton Man of the Year winner. Even though they booed him on draft day, he never stopped working in the community and raising a ton of money for Houston when floodwaters ravished the city. J.J. Watt was also named to the NFL's All-Decade team for the 2010s and was the 2017 Burt Bell Award winner, thus is definitely worthy of being called a star on and off the field. Nick Fairley, on the other hand, never made a single Pro Bowl in his six lackluster years in the league. Now he just may be the one delivering pizzas as he was arrested several times during and after his NFL career with Pizza Hut being one of the only companies that would hire him today. Now, did you think this video would be possible without including one of the most famous NFL draft analysts in the industry today? <laughs> no. We've made a video on Mel Kuyper in the past, and if you guys want part two to that video, make sure you let me know in the comment section down below. But one of his biggest gaffes going back in time, in 2001, Mel Kuyper declared LaDainian Tomlinson the 25th best available player in the 2001 NFL Draft, which is a low slot for such a dynamic player. Although his college days were spent at Texas Christian University, a team that was at that point competing in the Western Athletic Conference, which which was not a NFL factory by any means, he still shouldn't have been considered as the third best running back in the draft class, slotted behind Deuce McAllister and Michael Bennett. 
Ladanian Tomlinson rushed for 1,974 yards and 20 touchdowns in his junior season in 1999, and 2,158 yards and 22 touchdowns in 2000. San Diego had their own experts and called on Tomlinson as the sixth overall pick in the NFL draft, and he earned his high draft status, becoming the fifth leading rusher in NFL history with 13,684 yards. Tomlinson also had more touchdowns and yards on the ground than both McAllister and Bennett combined. For San Diego, he put in nine productive years and then had two more with the Jets before he retired and earned his bust in Canton. Now, if you think this take was bad by Mel Kuyper, we have an absolutely egregious draft prediction by Mel Kuyper coming later in this video and you do not want to miss it. Mel, we haven't started yet. Just get warmed up, Robert. Going way back in time, there was a quarterback from the University of Pittsburgh who, when the Miami Dolphins selected him with their first round pick, 27th overall, in the 1983 NFL Draft, left one very notorious Sports Illustrated writer named Paul Zimmerman baffled. When the Dolphins took Dan Marino, the SI writer said, Announcement for the selection of Danny Marino. I don't so, understand it. Uh, I don't, number one, I don't know who is going to work with him down there. Uh, who is, where is the great quarterback coaching genius of the offense? I know Arnold Parker is a great defensive coach. I don't see where he's going to get this great coaching that's going to overcome the problems he's had. Yet Marino, under Don Shula's tutelage, won the NFL MVP that next season and became the NFL's first 5,000-yard passer year two as well. Slipping to the 27th overall pick seemed shocking, but back then there was a big rumor prior to that 1983 draft that may have caused Marino to cause teams to back away from calling his name earlier. Marvin Demoff, who was Dan Marino's agent, said that there were rumors about Dan Marino's problem with drugs and it may have affected his draft stock, even towards the end of his senior collegiate season, which wasn't his best. The University of Pittsburgh tested him for drugs, but NFL teams never saw those results leading up to the draft. I started representing him and I realized there were at least questions. Demoff said about Marino's possible dangerous hobby. I actually had a general manager from a team say to me when he came to talk to me before the draft, he said, you're Dan's roommate. And he said, I said, yeah. And he said, um, we want to know if you use drugs too. I said, you're kidding me, right? And he said, uh, no, I'm dead serious. I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't know where you're getting all these rumors from. And I don't know where you're getting all this information from, but he's my roommate and I'm telling you that's not the case. Those drug rumors were so extensive that former Steelers coach Chuck Knoll admitted in a 1992 Associated Press interview to passing on Marino specifically because of the possibility that he might not be clean. Remember, Marino played for the University of Pittsburgh, so going to the Steelers would have made a lot of sense. Yet in 1983, the devil's lettuce was considered a major drug and school kids everywhere were chanting, just say no. So going after Marino may have been a little blown out of proportion, and it turned out Dan Marino hobbies didn't include Ryan Leaf-like drug use. Marino made it to nine Pro Bowls with 61,000 career passing yards, and 420 touchdown passes. No, that's not a joke. That's actually the amount of touchdown passes. Did not flub at all. No, it wasn't a flub. It was there was no f flub. Don Shula and the Miami Dolphins front office were geniuses in selecting Dan Marino in 1983, but in 1998, when there was a different head coach in South Beach by the name of Jimmy Johnson, he had a very bad move and a bad prediction. The Dolphins traded down from the 19th overall pick to number 29, and if they would have kept that 19th overall, they could have selected a receiver by the name of Randy Moss. Instead, the receiver they selected with the 82nd overall pick was a man named Larry Shannon from East Carolina. Jimmy Johnson told the Sun Sentinel in 1998 that with Larry Shannon coming to our football team, by the way, he's probably a step faster than Randy Moss. So he's bigger, he's taller, he's faster. Sometimes everybody gets all carried away. 
For instance, with Moss, and I don't want to be talking about somebody else's player, I'm just going to make an example. Some of these people get so carried away, I'd like to pull them aside and say, how many films did you grade in coming to your evaluation? I say, well, did you ever even see him play? Oh, you've seen three or four highlights. You actually watched SportsCenter, and that's how you made your evaluation of this player. And so we have a lot of scouts. A lot of coaches do a tremendous amount of research. We're paid to do it. We've been doing it our entire lives. And I don't know that somebody in the media can watch SportsCenter and make the evaluation for us as far as who we should have picked. It is really hard to find Larry Shannon highlights, probably because he just played in two games in the NFL. As for Randy Moss, from his Bolitnikoff Award-winning All-American College days through his entire 14-year NFL career, he has some of the best highlights ever for a wide receiver. From his NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year season in 1998, through his six-time Pro Bowl years, and the five times he was the NFL receiving touchdown leader, he has mossed them all. Randy Moss has his gold jacket, and as for Jimmy Johnson's favorite receiver, I'm guessing it didn't end up being Larry Shannon like he predicted. Following the 2012 NFL Draft, our favorite expert, Mel Kuyper Jr., and a whole lot of other people all agreed that the Seattle Seahawks blew it with their draft class. As if the day wasn't bad enough, Seattle, selecting Russell Wilson, a QB who doesn't fit their offense at all, was by far the worst move of the draft. With the two worst moves of the draft, Seattle is the only team that received an F on draft day, said Donald Wood via Bleacher Report. As for Mel Kuyper, he gave a grade of a C-. Sports Illustrated's Chris Burke gave the class a C. CBS's Pete Prisco gave the Wilson pick a D. The Seattle Seahawks first round pick Bruce Irvin may have not been worthy of going first but he had nine sacks as a rookie and ended up with 52 sacks in his career. Far from being a draft bust, but far from being a NFL legend. He would play out his entire rookie contract in Seattle before going elsewhere. The Seattle Seahawks day two phone call to Bobby Wagner was certainly nothing to be graded negatively for as he ended up a six time first team all pro and an eight time pro bowler and part of the NFL's all decade team. The linebacker also led the NFL in tackles 2016 and 2019. Undersized Russell Wilson is a nine-time Pro Bowler, Bart Starr Award winner, and turned that franchise around and drove them right into a February shower of confetti with his dropbacks. That failing grade draft class went from a 7-9 record in 2010 to 2011 to a Super Bowl contender, then they won the whole thing in 2013. That's worth at least an A- in my book. We have gone over Mel Kuyper Jr.'s bad predictions over and over, but once again, the errors must be discussed. After the Detroit Lions selected USC wide receiver Mike Williams number 10 overall in the 2005 NFL Draft, Kuyper told fellow ESPN analyst Merrill Hodge, I'll see you at his Hall of Fame induction. You have a guy that didn't even play last year number one. What gift? Uh, you have a decision to make when you rate players because you say, okay, who's the guy that's going to be number one on your board? And I looked at it and I said, okay, see so some question marks with some of the guys below him. And you look at a guy like Mike Williams. Had he played this year, it would have been a spectacular season with Leinert and company. And I think he would have been the Clear cut number one. I look at Mike Williams as a guy who I think can come in without pressure because he's going to go probably down the line just a bit. Certainly not going to be one, two, or three overall. And I think he's going to be a heck of a player and he's going to be a steal. But that was a bold and perhaps one of the worst draft day predictions ever as Mike Williams had already been on the downhill slide. He had been an All American in 2003 during his sophomore season at USC, but then was ruled ineligible after withdrawing from school, hiring an agent, signing paperwork, and attempting to declare for the 2004. NFL Draft. So Williams didn't play the collegiate season before the 2005 NFL Draft. Then, in his first three seasons in the league, he posted only 539 yards. On the first day of the 2007 NFL Draft, he was traded to Oakland and played in only six games. The Titans signed him for the remainder of the 2007 season, but he didn't see the field. Then, after two years out of football, he came back with the Seahawks and his former coach Pete Carroll, almost reaching 1,000 yards in two seasons combined. But in 2011, he broke his leg, caught only 18 footballs, and that was it. Mike Williams' label of a draft bust is far from the Hall of Fame career that Mel Kuyper predicted. In the 2009 NFL Draft, both Mike Mayock and Mel Kuyper Jr. called Aaron Curry, an outside linebacker from Wake Forest, the safest pick in the NFL Draft. 
Mike Mayock, when speaking about Aaron Curry, said, I think Curry is the safest pick in the draft. When sitting at number three, you can't make a mistake. He has to be a good football player, and Curry is that kind of guy. Mayock then said that Curry couldn't be compared to anyone and that he could play equally well as an outside linebacker in a 3-4 or a 4-3. Then ESPN draft analyst Mel Kuyper was asked, who was the safest pick in the draft? Nobody, he said. Everybody comes with risk. However, Kuyper then added, people would say Aaron Curry. He's not going to be a bust. He can rush the passer and drop in coverage. He would fall into that category. Maybe not a boom, but certainly not a bust. If you put a gun to my head, I'd say Curry. Aaron Curry, who the Seahawks selected with the fourth overall pick in the draft, couldn't ever be compared to any NFL linebacker as he hardly was the definition of a pro player. As in 30 starts for the Seattle Seahawks, he only had five and a half sacks. Yet 10 years after he was drafted, Aaron Curry again found himself as a member of the Seahawks, this time as an assistant coach and for three seasons has been on Pete Carroll's staff. I, I would say my NFL tenure didn't go how I dreamed it to go because I just wasn't motivated. I just didn't, I looked up and there was nothing that kept me going, you know. I wanted to play in the NFL because I wanted to get the paycheck. And I wanted to get my mom out of her situation. I wanted to change my situation. I wanted to be able to provide for my children. And I did that. And at the end of it, I kind of would look up and there was nothing that would keep me going. But there was an error in my motivation. Internally, I am different now. I have a different motivation. My motivation is now I can change the world and that can last forever. This next player was too tempting to bypass, according to USA Today Sports. That was about Geno Smith, quarterback of West Virginia prior to the first round of the 2013 NFL Draft. The reputable print publication said he was too tempting, especially since he has skills similar to Cam Newton. Geno Smith, though, couldn't post a winning record as a starting quarterback. But that does seem like an impossible task, as no one has been able to do that for the New York Jets in many years. Geno Smith did double his rushing touchdowns from college to eight scores in the NFL, but by comparison, Newton had 75 rushing touchdowns. Also, even after six seasons of trying, Geno Smith just couldn't throw more touchdowns than picks, as his final stat line reads 34 touchdowns to 37 interceptions. Cam Newton has 194 touchdowns to 123 career interceptions, and has been a three-time Pro Bowler and a league MVP in 2015. That is one terrible comparison, but speaking of Cam Newton, there was more than one expert who predicted that Cam Newton wouldn't be the type of player that he has shown that he was capable of, and one analyst even went as far as to criticize his face. Very disingenuous, has a fake smile, comes off as very scripted, and has a very selfish me-first makeup, said Nolan Naraki on Cam Newton via the big lead. Pretty much the worst. Go ahead and talk about a quarterback's ability to adapt under pressure, even say that that player has a weak arm or is slow out of the pocket, but to comment negatively on his smile? That's just digging too low. Naraki, who was a writer for Pro Football Weekly, even said GM Marty Herney would destroy his reputation like Bobby Beathard did, the GM who drafted Ryan Leaf, if the Panthers took Cam Newton. Cam Newton, though, went on to lead the Carolina Panthers to the playoffs four times. Even Chris Collinsworth didn't believe in Cam. On May 11, 2011, he tweeted that one of his least favorite first-round picks was Cam Newton, who he called high risk. Perhaps in present day 2022, an aging free agent Cam Newton would be considered high risk. But back in 2011, he was far from that as he went on to win Offensive Rookie of the Year honors and got fans into the Carolina stands. There have been a lot of bad predictions since so-called experts, fans, and others have begun discussing the NFL Draft. What do you think was the worst draft prediction of all time? If you enjoy the video and this gets to 7,000 likes, we'll do a part two. Aside from that, I'm your boy Mike, and I'm dropping our mic until our next upload.